those good evening the board I'd like to welcome everyone tonight thank you for being here notice is hereby given of a regular meeting of the board of directors of the district to be held at 105 port road port isabel texas on the 26th day of september 2018 at the hour of 5 30 p.m for consideration of the business of the agenda below this notice is posted at the office of the district on september 21st 2018 at 2 p.m in accordance with the texas opens meetings act texas government code 5510415510 not less than 72 hours prior to the time of the said meeting. We do have the presence of a quorum. All the board members are present. I may please have uh, everyone stand for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this uh, time that we've put together, Lord, to uh, go through the agenda items as the board members uh, make decisions tonight, Lord. Help us be more transparent, Lord. Help us be more uh, easy understood, Lord, in all our needs that we have for the district, that we try to be good stewards, Lord, to uh, help uh, our services be better, that we can help our customers, our neighbors, Lord God, better, a uh, better service. And we just ask you that uh, guide us tonight as we make the decisions on, on the agendas. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you. <coughs> Item three, invitation to the audience for public comments. So anyone at the time? Yes? <coughs> Please state your name for the record. Uh, I'm Bill Carr from the golf course. Uh, I'm just appearing to thank the staff, etc. We put in a new pump house a couple of weeks back, and at the same time, the water district was uh, changing the valve, etc. So uh, the staff, uh, all of them, uh, really interface with our people to minimize the downtime and to you know, help the community. The pump house we put in uh, is a $120,000 investment being the body to raise the golf course. And the staff was very professional, helping us understand uh, how uh, the property was fed and the consequences of various items that actually were covered. And, uh, just wanted to thank them. Thank, thank you for thank sharing you. your comments. Anyone else like to discuss anything at this time? Yes. At, the, at our last workshop, uh, I expressed some disappointment and reservations that our general manager was not present for the workshop in our regular meeting. That was before I knew that he was on a vaca well-deserved vacation that had been planned for two years. So I apologize to the general manager and the staff for speaking without knowing. I'm sorry. Thank you, Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Anyone else like to make any comments or anything that includes the board, staff, public? Anyone at this time? Thank you. I'd like to move to item number four. Consider and discuss for possible approval the minutes of the regular meeting on September 12, 2018. So moved. Motion made by R. Wells. Second. Seconded by Mr. Avalos. Are all those in favor? Aye. They are. Any opposed? None. For the motion, I abstain. I was uh, absent from the meeting, but that doesn't matter just for the record. <coughs> motion does pass. Item five, general manager's report. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I wanted to uh, bring up the elections update hoping that uh, the applicants have received emails from the elections officer, mm -hmm. emails on uh, attending the, I guess, orientation and other information that goes with, uh, with the elections. Okay. I have. Glad to hear that. Okay, thank you. And if there's any other questions on anybody else that is not here tonight, uh, applicants, have questions, come up, call me. Uh, I spoke to okay. Remy. To, I spoke to Remy also, so okay. directly. So good. They're very receptive. Good deal. Helpful. If there's any other questions? Let me know, and I can answer. I got a question. Is there going to be a forum? That's put on. Forum? That's, that's put on by the chambers or uh, outside. Entities. Normally, a uh, forum is, you know, like what what the uh, board members can do for the district that's and whatnot. And we normally don't have one. Okay. You know, but we can advertise uh, the applicants. You know, somehow. Just it's election is normal. Yeah, but it should run be normal. Yeah, it is it's run by the county, so normally uh, I think everything is, is going well right now. 
uh, let's keep in mind that the early voting will be October the starting October the 22nd all the way to November the 2nd and the election day is November the 6th but any other questions that you might have call me if uh, any concerns that you all might have thank you uh, the other one that I have right now is I have uh, two employees of the water district that I would like to recognize because uh, they were re uh, given a good uh, recommendation because uh, one of them was a good steward. Let me see if I can find that paper real quick. Well, the island resident was Jim Fuller. He recommended that uh, Omar Aldes, Omar, you here? Well, I invited him to the meeting tonight so I can recognize him. Uh, he did so, uh, a good uh, presentation to, to Jim Fuller up in the island, giving him a lot of information on the new meters that we're installing. He had a problem, and he uh, Omar answered the questions right away and gave him a, a good explanation of what was happening, and he understood what was happening, too. So he said, thank you for having a good uh, employee, and, uh, and he's a... Uh, Omar Valdez, he's not here today, but, and then um, I did receive an email from Rolando Vela, City of Laguna Vista uh, City Manager, that uh, a customer of his over in Laguna Vista had uh, recognized another employee, that he had gotten a flat tire up in the, in the middle of the night, and one of the employees stopped and helped him out, Kenji Hoshino, and uh, he calls him a, a, a good Samaritan. So just wanted to recognize him also and see what the, uh, you know, the, the, we usually get the, the bad stuff on employees who they're not doing right. But then when you get something like this, they need to be recognized also. So thank you guys for doing your best to keep the district up. Thank you. Thank you. You can stand up. I can see you. But yeah. There you go. Thank you. I, I received a <coughs> call from Jim Holder, and he's a customer and a good friend of mine. Lived down the street from my shop in uh, he does his own maintenance on some of the houses he rents. He has a few house rentals, and uh, he was just so complimentary on, on the gentleman that helped him. He said, man, he was very smart. He, he presented himself well. He presented the district well, and he just couldn't stop saying enough good things. So I, I said, I better pass that along because yeah. yeah. it doesn't happen that often. Thank you, too, Carlos, for that, passing the message to, to me. Thank you kindly. It's nice to hear good things. Amen. Say good things. Item six, director of operations report. Robert. Good, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, I have submitted the for your purview the um, number of calls that have been that were made for the month of August. On the distribution side, there were hundred and 96 calls, uh, the death was customer service, distribution, sewer plant, uh, managers, collection, and electrical. And they're all broken down into the different categories that are listed there. In the uh, collection side, we had 69 calls. Uh, again, these were 62 that uh, were for collections. Uh, Five with call outs and, and two for list stations. And as you can see, uh, oh, over half of them, just a little over half of them have been preventive maintenance. Uh, we try to make sure that the, the uh, lines are clear so we don't get called in the middle of the night. Any questions? So that would be a call out or just preventive maintenance? It's, uh, it's preventive maintenance, but they have to log it in uh, as a call out to keep track of it. So did somebody actually call in, or no, was that just under a routine? No, it's a routine, but they still make a a, uh, a service call, a call out, uh, and record it as such. It's not part of their routine work. Yes. It is, but it's extra work. Yes. Being a call out. It, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other uh, item <coughs> that uh, I brought uh, or 
submit for you all to review with the um, the rehabilitation of the uh, warehouse roof. And uh, I submitted some pictures, as, as you can see, uh, some of the apartments were pretty damaged by the water. They were divided out quite a bit. So we had to replace the produce in the front uh, all the way around both warehouses. And then there was one warehouse that uh, had a Z curtains that needed to be replaced. Those were pretty rotted out as well. And so I gave you a, a little narrative as to uh, what they did in replacing those, uh, those curtains. And of course, the damage was caused by the water that was stagnant in the uh, in the gutters. And uh, it was amazing that we started to work, which was in mid-July, and noticed that there was still water, even though we hadn't had any rain for pretty much over a month. And so we had to take all of that down. We didn't face any of the gutters. Uh, to say created the damage. I didn't see you putting any new gutters in there, and, along with the downspouts. Why was the water standing? It was just where the where the gutters were joined, where they put two gutters together. It, it was just there. It, it looked like it was a low spot. Did you say? No. Yeah, it just it's just water that stayed there. It, I guess it, it lost its uh, slope at this level. I guess. Uh, the construction crew did a pretty good job in uh, fixing those up. Mr. Wells uh, went by there and, and looked at it this afternoon. Looks like you saved us a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, when I was here back in 2013, we got an estimate because we were looking at replacing that roof. That estimate came in at approximately 130, a little less than 135. That was back five years ago. So hopefully, the, with this the work that, that was done, the roof will last another five to ten years. Yeah, for what, nine grand or something? So how do you beat that? I'm sorry? Uh, for nine grand, I think it says yes. grand. Yeah. I can't yeah, beat that. It was a pretty good job. They did. Good job. Uh, the other item that I have was an update on the AMI Mueller. And uh, we passed the uh, conference calls with uh, Ferguson and Mueller. And uh, right now, Mueller is in the process of, of uh, talking with uh, Tyler Technology with Encode. They are uh, setting up the uh, uh, data, my host data, uh, on cloud. And so they're trying to get everything squared away with, uh, uh, with Tyler Technology. One of the things that we just found out today was that uh, Encode is coming in and saying that uh, we need to pay two dollars for to upload all the accounts for each account, which will probably come out to approximately between twelve thousand and thirty pounds. Yeah, right around there. Uh, that's this something that was not budgeted, but uh, we <laughs> may be able to take that out of the total contract, and, and that's part of the of the cost of the system. So we can probably take it out of that. Uh, and a half minutes, we have We're starting to get into this nickel and diming deal. This yes, unfortunately. That's a one shot deal, though. Yes. It's not like some monthly deal or something. No. And no. the timeline seems to uh, be running a little <coughs> stagnant, too. No, a lot stagnant. <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot that, that's being uh, done. It doesn't, it doesn't appear like it is, but uh, one of the things that uh, Joel is communicating with uh, Bill. Ron Mueller is okay. finding locations for the repeaters. Uh, we've, we've pretty much identified the location, but we're having to get uh, permission from AP. I think we're probably going to give that up. Uh, for the record, Dennis, oh, excuse me, for the record, uh, Doyle said he had an unexcused, or uh, uh, oh, emergency came up. I didn't take care of it for the record. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, that came up just recently uh, in talking with AP is that they're coming up with a lot of uh, rules, regulations that we need to adhere to, uh, along with insurance, uh, providing copies of our insurance policies. So we're probably going to, if we can 
go another route, which we're looking at, uh, just installing some poles in our own. But we need to get permission to be able to install poles uh, in different areas. Uh, we're looking at doing uh, a couple in Laguna Vista. But you're on the right of way. What do you need permission for, really? Well, that's what we understand. At least that's what uh, the well is. Well, if you're on the right of way, you have the right to do, I mean, what we're doing also is looking at, at our lift stations and where we do have some poles in some of them and see if we can install poles in, on some of the other ones uh, that are convenient uh, to the area where, where we need to transfer the data. To, uh, well, it's going to go up to the uh, cloud, so hopefully we can do that. Uh, the town of Laguna Vista has already given us permission and we thank them. Uh, for using one of the towers, the, the one that they have there in the library. Uh, we're going to use the, and install a repeater there. The repeater is uh, about three feet tall and uh, six inches wide and weighs about 16 pounds with the battery. Uh, so that's part of the problem in, in trying to locate uh, the place. The town of South Padre has also uh, given us the okay in some areas, but uh, we need to get a definite answer. The, the telling us yes, and then the telling us that we need to look at insurance and liability insurance and so forth. So uh, we're going back and forth with that. But, uh, we are we are making some progress as far as that's concerned. We have received quite a bit of equipment at this point. We've received uh, a little under 1,700 uh, uh, feeders, and the uh, the readers, the repeaters. Uh, those we have them stocked up at the warehouse and we just received some additional equipment uh, yesterday yesterday afternoon so we're stocking that uh, we've already talked to Mueller uh, and they they're telling us to just go ahead and hold on to that uh, the other thing that they're looking at is that hopefully by mid October that they can start with the installation on the meters but <coughs> That's something that we are going to discuss in the next uh, in the next agenda item uh, with the board and, and see what direction the board wants to give us to, as far as the, with the financing of the meters. Uh, the update on the rehab of the backhoe uh, that was an agenda or that is an item for next year's budget. We originally got a quote of fifteen thousand on a used cabin cabin from uh, 2000 we don't know what shape it's in that's something that we need to look at uh, they want sell it to us 15 that is uh, those uh, dogged uh, or John Deere but uh, they will charge us 11,000 for installing it so I've, I've been talking with the construction manager and uh, uh, he's game as far as putting that in but uh, we need to make sure that, that uh, we can do that in case we run into any trouble because it's not just a matter of taking one cabin out and putting another one in. There's a lot of uh, hoses and uh, electrical that need to be taken care of. As well. What year what year tobacco is that? 2000. It's half the price of the we got We got a quote and a new cabin for 58000 off the spine, you knowing they're never the same. By the time you go through all that, the hoses are all you know, we got nothing but problems and issues from there on out. Just my two cents. So, and we got a quote on a new backhoe for 111000 plus with with all the equipment that you yes, want. Yes, sir. And the other one you're repairing at 2000, I mean, an 18 year old unit, it, it doesn't add up. It's my I, I, opinion. In my opinion, I don't think it can be because we have no idea how much longer it'll last. Uh, electrical, uh, hoses, the uh, motor, and so on. I don't think the numbers make sense. That's just right. my opinion. You're, you're going to get 25 years out of a good backhoe if you run it properly and maintain it. I mean, uh, you're, anyways. That's yes, sir. Thing. And that's true. The problem is the, the weather in this area. Yeah. Uh, that concludes my report uh any questions i just have a question in regards to the the 
facilities, the buildings, do we have somebody that's going and physically looking at these on a regular basis? And what kind of schedule is that? Uh, no, we don't. Then, okay. And are you talking about all the buildings? Or? I'm talking about our warehouses, the plants. Does anybody do a walkthrough at some point and evaluate the facility and say, okay, where are we at? What needs to be patched up? But I, I think we need to do that because asset management uh, situation. What we normally do, have, what, what we normally do is every month the staff has a monthly report, a safety report that they have to fill in, and they go check the whole facility. If there's something broken or needs attention, they they uh, uh, do a work order and send it back, and they'll repair it and take care of it but on the well, monthly how, basis. How do we handle? How do we handle the? Things like like rust joints that are rusted, uh, things like that. How do we handle that? We uh, go in there, sand it down. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking is, does that go into the report? Into the report uh, on a monthly basis. The deferred maintenance, no. basically. Yeah. No, you want to add something. The reason the reason, yeah, the reason I'm bringing this up yeah, is because I is because <coughs> I I get the sense on some of these things that when like for instance. A good example is this this building that we just rehabbed. That's in bad shape. I mean, that's in really bad shape. It should have never gotten to that shape. That's my point. And so, in in order for that not to happen, we need somebody that's going and checking on these facilities on a regular basis. And when you see stuff coming up, you fix it then. You don't wait till it gets to this point. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. And I guess I I'm going to say this for as a general rule whether it's a tractor or whether it's a building, if we stay on top of it, it's going to last longer. You know, but if you let it go to the point of deterioration, then we're forced to replace it. I get that. I know the way that works. I want us to stay on top of it. I want us to do these inspections on a regular basis. Uh, I think you being our director of operations should be in charge of that or yes. have somebody assigned to doing that. Yes, and, and honestly, at this point, I haven't done enough of it, but I have done some of it, and I have gone to uh, the water plants, sewer plants, and, and looked around and uh, checked along with some of the recommendations that the construction manager has made. And I asked the manager from that plant to, uh, to take care of it. Uh, a lot of times it's just putting in a, uh, a board on an ease. Uh, under the uh, the roof of, of a small building or whatever. One of the problems is that we don't have the manpower just to take care of that. I, I brought up the issue about deferred maintenance and we do have a lot of deferred maintenance. And, and some of it deals with budget. And we just don't know how much it's gonna run until we get into it. Right. And, and the construction crew, they do a lot of this uh, whenever they can, but they're always busy trying to get the water plant or the sewer plant up and running. And they have quite a few projects for the four or five guys that they that are recruited. Yeah, we, we do address it as, as much as and often as we can. But again, that is uh, that is quite a bit of time. So everybody busy is like the uh, warehouse. I'm going back to that. One of the things that uh, we've been trying to do is, is paint all the permits. Uh, we started on it, but we get busy with something else yeah. and, and we get sidetracked. We're trying to get back, when, that's on schedule for next Monday, to get back and, and try and finish the painting of the permits. But there is quite a bit of work in, and uh, we're trying to do as much as we can. Yeah, no, I know I know that overall you guys are doing really good in, in bringing in these uh, costs down and re doing our own internal repairs. Uh, but when I see something as deteriorated as that building, it kind of makes me think that we're not we're not addressing it soon enough. And, well, and, you know, wanna, really, and if really it's a question of money, things. if it's a question of budget, then we need we need staff to bring something forward saying this is how much money we need, this is how many people we need to take care of these issues, because that's the only way we're going to address it. I don't expect for people who already have jobs that are doing their work right. to pull them off that to, to go do that. I mean, they'll do it when they have time, and I get that, but. It's a question of staffing or budget, and we need to address it. And, and honestly, like in this case, uh, since it's not an eyesight level, you yeah. have to be looking up. You couldn't tell right off. You can see sunspots, but not as much as when we started getting into it. Once we started getting into it, then we really noticed 
I've got to check you out. Yeah, yeah and, and, that's what, and that's what that individual will be doing. He will be climbing ladders. He will be picking up stuff and moving things to make sure that there's not rust or things deteriorating behind what you cannot see. You know, I mean, the obvious, yeah, but you have to actually move stuff around, get on top of roofs and poke at things to make sure that, that they're not rotting from, in, you know, or you can't see Asset that. management, they call it. I'm not sure what you call it, but we need something like that because uh, our facilities are very expensive to maintain uh, and to replace. And I think that it would benefit us to put a department or create the budget or whatever we need to do to stay on top of it because replacement is much more expensive than just oh, yes. taking care of it. Oh, yeah. But thank you. No, you guys overall, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Charles, number seven. Right, yeah, come on. Right, let's see. So our first item is just an update on water rights, which uh, I think it has been meaning because that's been like a lot back. Um, but, uh, but basically, uh, from the last uh, report through the end of August, uh, they had uh, they had, they had cut down our you know diversion another 583 feet, and plus we diverted 583 feet for the month. So just basically that, that diversion for August was 1,166, which you account for the drought plus what we actually use for water. But but the good thing is, you know at, at that point the, the reservoirs were down 44.6 percent. But with the, the last report as of September 15th, that the rains were back up to 47.8 percent, and there's more rain coming. So, you know, we're at the point of the reservoir is coming back up. So, but we're still at that point where we're growing. So that, that's kind of where we're at on the, uh, on a, in terms of, you know, making sure we have the water rate authorization. Um, we did uh, complete that change of ownership uh, for the, we closed on that, on that water rights where we're proceeding to, to put sale, you know, in the for the board. So basically now we got ownership of that 269.6 uh, acre feet of class A water rights. And so the next steps to convert that to municipal, which will we'll add it to our certificate, uh, we'll add 134.8 acre feet uh, to our water right authorization. And then plus we also have 100 acre feet that for some reason, you know, 20, 30 years ago got changed to domestic. And we just can put that back to municipal. So then what, what is our total uh, acre feet? Oh, under normal conditions? If with, yeah, and with the new additions and uh, the conversions. I need to. Well, okay, it. just send it whenever. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah. No big deal. Our normal is under. It's uh, a little over 7100, something like that. Yeah, so so 7146, and then we're going to add uh, 234. It's supposed okay. to be 7300. Oh, so, yeah, 7346, right? Right. So we're going to be up to 7546 once we take care of the next step in our vehicle. Right. So that's, that's, yeah, that's where we're at on water rights. And then uh, I guess the next item is the construction progress at Port of Sewer Plant. Um, from the mechanical component of work, they're substantially complete. We already finished that portion of work. They already took down the crane. Um, for the next month or two, they're uh, going to be finished out the electrical instrumentation. And so we're looking at, you know, the final here in, in November. And so as far as, um, you know, we're at the point of negotiating the final uh, change order request, which is going to be a deduct for items that, you know, ended up not being needed. So, you know, we're looking at like a deduct of 61745 dollars and that'll will be presented at the next meeting. And so uh, that's basically where we're at in terms of construction you know, progress or finishing the job. So that'll be presented in Lima on our next line trying to shoot the next meeting and get how we And so uh, any other questions on construction progress or alright, so moving on to the next one. That's the update on the water plant two settling pond rehab or clean out, which it might be good for both Noe and Richard to kind of talk about our, our update at Water Plant 2. So I don't know if you want to come up, since there's multiple things going on out there. I mean, one of it is the permitting aspect, where we wanted to register the site for line application. And we submitted that to TCQ on September 20th. We did a hand delivery since we were up there in Austin. So that's already, we started the talk with the permit request. For the record, we have Dora Wells joining the meeting back. All right, just in time. We just started on the selection booth. <laughs> so uh, anyways, I brought up Richard King. Um, I don't know, I guess I'll let Richard kind of give an update of where we're at with the new looking at the project. Um, so
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Richard Correa with Garber and Parliament for the record. Uh, it's been a while, sorry, I've been out of, out of pocket for a while. I'm proud to announce I'm a new father of a one month old boy, so I've got a two year old, and I know he was born August 24th, so I've been out of the loop for a while, but we're back in the saddle again and we're here to provide an update on where we're at on this project. Uh, based on the last direction, last time I was here, um, we decided to just proceed with an additional lagoon. So, what we're trying to do here is lay out an exact a similar size uh, unit process to what's existing at the plant, the second lagoon that provides some flexibility in operation for D1. And so as you can see, we're doing about a 260 by 141 uh, foot lagoon there. Why is it separated on four sides? Why aren't we using the north, north boundary for the north part of the lagoon instead of building a whole new Yes, sir. Wall there. Good question. There's some infrastructure sitting there. I think there's a water line going to SPI golf course yeah, and a mag meter. Yeah, we need to keep a 30 foot strip at natural ground to access the low water line. It's under, it's in that area? Yeah, it's about 16 feet south of the fence. South of the fence. The, the, yeah. Move the line. Would it be cheaper to move the line than it would be to take and build a whole separate berm? No, it, as yeah. in relocate. Yeah. yeah, it would just, you know. You, you no, I don't know. <laughs> or, you know, if, if you would fill in that area. I, I'm sure you don't want another water level. So. It's gravity fed. Right. It's gravity fed. And it's down, it's south of the existing berm on the south end of the lagoon. Correct? Yeah, for the fence that's existing, that's where we measure an offset. It's about 16 feet. 16 that's feet that's south line. or north? Uh, south of the fence. South of the fence. So it's going to be underneath. Yeah, if we fill it, then, you know, we, we kind of have to deal with that moisture. If we shared berms, we'd be burying infrastructure that could possibly require. And that's why I was asking, would it be easier to move right. the infra infrastructure right. versus build a berm? I, I don't know the exact alignment of that, but it seems like that would be a pretty costly endeavor because we've got the lagoon on the north side and it's a long way to be clear lagoon even further north. And we're bound by the reservoir on the northwest side. So And the flip of that is you're creating a mini lagoon in between the two in the sense you're gonna have a berm existing berm and another berm, new berm to the south of that. Right. So the outer edges would be taken care of by grading. We have to grade that back to the front of the plant. Yes sir. Precise drainage. And then to the to the west, you have some existing berm there already that's almost up to to elevation. Correct. Just eyeballing it again today. Right. On Charles' recommendation, our initial recommendation was to share that embankment, but we've got over three feet of drop from the northwest side of this proposed lagoon to the south side. There's also a lift station and some other equipment right over here on uh, the northeast side of that pier wall. So at this time we're proposing just a Well, way. you drew a nice square line here, a rectangular line, but you know, if a part of that west embankment could be utilized as the embankment for the lagoon, why wouldn't we take advantage of that opportunity? Yes, sir. Well, again, just to create a level crown of this embankment, we figured it's easier just to- Spend more money. Form up, form up a rectangle on its own. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. This is this is high up here, and it does drop off over here, but there's a good portion of that already there. You have a share existing. Great. We'll take a look at that and see how much we can make. Well, it makes a nice pretty rectangular line here, but it doesn't have to be where you're holding water. Application on ground. And if we can share, we can cut down overall. You know, I can tell you right now, half of that line there, you know, that's 20, 30 grand of dirt yes, that we would have to take and put in there. My same old figure like you've been saying, 10 bucks a yard. Where, where is this line that you guys are talking about? Is it here? Yes. Yeah, it's buried this, here? Yeah, this takes us in this. So all this area is an extra round one, but you know, right. it's like, so basically this fence right here, this house is Yeah, I did, yes, yes. I did. I did. But they say there's a, there's a gravity, gravity feed line here. Right there. You can see that fence 
and it's just there's and some fence right there. Yeah, so the gravity feed line is considering right. connecting the two here and running I get that. Line and but then I'm asking so why are we not doing something like that? From here to here we've got just about or just over three feet of drop. But what they were they down here? Yeah, that's to here. From down there we're we're probably ten feet. Because this is much slower than this. Have you done anything to see what kind of uh, material that we have for the center that can be used? We've got a GSS so far, yes, sir. And we're actually requesting these revisals. If we can pull a three foot of out of here, you've got the five and a half, six foot elevation here by my simple app. And so if you can do three foot of dirt there, that goes a long ways for building all of this. And then you're taking it down three feet to where you're only going to be up here seven feet on your burn. I thought that was the point of doing If you're looking at a ten foot reservoir. This is natural ground and this is typical obviously. section. Here and then you're taking it down. Sorry. Two feet. And I got a question, Richard. Um, when we originally started talking about this, we were talking about when we set up this pond over here, the new one, that we were going to set it up so that we could use, well, one is full, we take care of that one, but we're using the other one, so it go back and forth. Correct. So if we're not going to have that pipe in between to connect them, because you're saying there's a line here that we don't want to upset that goes to the golf course, well, there's a line there already. We have the line there. We have the pump. We have the gate there. And I think that's what usually we're talking about. We could just butt well, up to that. The plumbing's there. They just add plumbing for the new lagoon so you can take and use one lagoon while you're drying another lagoon to clean it out. But you have right. you can use both of them independently. Right. I don't think the right raw water line is what we're talking about, or are you? No, sir. No. You're not speaking of that. Because the, the fill line, I, I was told today by Noe that that the fill line for this existing lagoon is up in the berm on the south end of the road. That's where it's located. Right. We're going to have to splice into there and we can shoot it either way from the pump station that's back over here. Yeah, and I guess that was, that's my question is, can we still do that? Can we alternate between the two? That's absolutely the intent. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, so going back to this, we're still looking at, in my terms, a simple cost mostly cost effective lagoon that we can come up with right and so uh, i raised my questions are raised why are we sharing all the berms that we can uh, instead of building other berms that aren't necessary for 50 feet difference between the two uh, that's certainly got to save a fair amount if we're lowering the depth two feet or three feet that's going to lower the overall height so we come closer to sharing the west berm with the existing berm that's there now. Yes, sir. So that minimizes that cost, and so we end up overall going to be building half of it or more. Well, excuse me, we're going to have to build three quarters of it because we got to build the north berm because of that pipe there. Yeah, we're, we're looking at this high two feet from its current elevation, but there's, you know, all that scrub, nine inches or so that's. I guess what I'm wondering is if we're going to build a berm over it, then that line's going to be buried anyway. No, they're or separating, the, they're taking the berm off of that. They move the berm away from that line so as not to bury it. Okay. Right. right. There's a 30 foot from the existing fence out there. We're proposing the total ditch to be 30 feet south to maintain an alignment to the well water main and natural bridge. Is the again, as, as we progress throughout design, we're, we're going to look for obviously as much cost saving opportunities as possible. This is preliminary. Um, this is based on, on the last <coughs> meeting and uh, an ideal situation from a constructability standpoint. It's probably not ideal from a cost saving standpoint at this point, but we'll work towards that. Sorry. I don't disagree and I don't agree because cost saving and construction are still one of the same and if you minimize your overall cost it's a, it's a saving so it's just yes, sir. like I've already said you know a nice pretty rectangular red line as opposed to utilizing our that's current uh, material that's there yes, Charles sir. how much property do we have to the west east I'm sorry of the existing lagoon uh, oh that, that fence line well we're proposing to relocate the fence so so 
That is the where, property line right there. Where, where that is the property old? line. Which, which is, looks like about 20 some feet. Like so a, this oh, is the property line. Yeah, right we're 20 feet off from the property line. <laughs> okay, so we have no room to do anything on the west side, or right. east side of the existing lagoon. Right. We, we, we've, we've moved it as far as we as we could, yes, sir. to the east and to the south. There's yeah, we bought that a little bit of land. Sorry to interrupt. We bought that little bit of land along the on that land deal we did because the east berm of the existing lagoon was on somebody else's property. Yeah, yeah. We, we so we fixed that problem. And this odd triangle that, you know, belonged to the, to the adjacent. And then it turns out that the eight acres from the transmission main almost... And is that all the area that we have? I keep interrupting, but I just want to get my questions in. What you've drawn in with the fence, is that all the area that we have for that? What we're proposing here is to take this 800 linear feet of, of existing fence. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 site, uh, the, the east. Fence. This 800 linear feet of existing fence, and then fence in the lagoon right here. Yeah. Your property line actually goes a little further. But yeah, but we have more property down here, so yeah. when you're doing that, is there any advantage to make that lagoon longer? Well, well, from, from, the, from the electrical transmission lines to the drainage right away, we're, we're reserving that space for land application. So we'll, by permit, when we're cleaning these lagoons, that's where we spread out the dirt graders or the soil. Yeah, I, I get that. But right now we're trying to take and have a settling pond for as long as we can. So my, my question is simply, are we better off building a longer settling pond at this point? I just think you have to deal with the, with the utility conference with the transmission. Well, I don't want to propose that. So, yeah. okay, I see. I see where the tracks are, and that would be the utility line. Right. We're taking as much as we can north of the transmission main. Basically. Okay. You still have room to kind of push that sucker on closer to the toe of the berm. Right. On the you can. You can. I'm interrupting again, but I'm looking at the fence you've drawn. I've seen a smaller holding pond inside. You have room to expand the holding pond to the toe of the berms up to the fence are pretty close. We're trying to avoid that so you can at least drive through there if you ever had to go around it. If the toe is at the fence. At the base. Yeah. Why do you want to drive around it? Uh, double exit. Just, yeah, just to leave space if you had to maintain it or something or mowing or anything. It can still be up in the berm. The this fence can. All I'm, my, whole my questions are to, if we're tackling it now, let's take in as much air as we can for the future needs of the district and it makes sense to me that while we're doing this we're still a lot cheaper project than what we have talked about before go ahead and open it up to a large holding pond that you can on that site i don't give a hoot about driving around looking at the fence and i don't give a hoot about i mean if anything because there's that that little section where we where the property just out under 60 feet so, I mean, you know, we don't keep a rectangle like that, <coughs> you know, another 60 foot. Like, this is that area where the property line goes from here to coming out here, so we could possibly, you know, add this section. As part of the okay, then, the if that said, would is that a better utilization, utilization of our land yeah. of doing something like that as opposed to yeah, that, we, that little sliver to the far, you might show up the other guys, what we're talking yeah. about, that little sliver on the, on the east side, have no use yeah. to us in the future. Yeah, so I mean, just to eliminate that S space, we can just add that bend to the building. That's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. And and is there any issues with doing that? Um, I mean, Charles, as far as far as the uh, no, if Charles didn't utilize that in his calculation for the land application, then, then no. yeah, it's not really <sighs> okay. So we still are stuck with the raw water line on the north side. We can't. I, I'm asking like for that to be give some thought to to see how it can be relocated well we wouldn't have to we have to get across the start of the business or even take the dead back it's just going to be there but it's going to be something that's going to be very hard access no it's just going to be inside the lagoon It'd be in the lagoon. Okay. Rather than rerouting it. Yeah, I, mean, I think we get this thing built. You know, a little bit of deep water and in shape for these things to be used. Between the two, going back and forth, I think 
in a fine shape. Yeah, and just, just to give you a, we had to do a lifetime estimate for like, their economics on the light application site. And if we would clean this balloon every year, it's been for eight years. So, you know, it's, we're not going to have other issues where we build our area. You know. I think it's appropriate. Legal can stop at any time, but while we're talking about the settling bonds, uh, existing sludge lagoon, uh, so we're talking about the new one, but I'm going to be talking about the old one. I was out there today, and it, they have dewatered it to the greatest extent practical possible. We still, we're getting to the point that, you know, it's still pretty soft. soft. You can't walk on it, but yet it's firm enough that you can dig it. And my thinking is that since we have been presented with a dire situation that we can't continue to run turbulent water into the existing pond, that we should go ahead and do something now that we've got the old existing pond dried out as much as possible, go in there and start digging it out on the south side about where they're pumping it out now and, and work around be watering as they dig dig out the, the, the sludge and then that liquid will run down to the lower part and they keep pumping it out as they're doing now so we're able they're able to take and remove more solid and not deal with the muck that we have right now. And if we start that operation today it'll just be our dump trucks taking it from up over here behind? Yeah you, right happen. now you can move it onto the south side door and I talked about it we can move it on the south side in front we can dry it till it's solid enough to handle it. But, you know, that takes care of a good half of the existing lagoon. Uh, I advocate that we go ahead and search out the equipment that can, can do that. I would like to shop around Texas to find the largest long-reach excavator or drag line that can do that. He has operators that can operate an excavator. And possibly we can hire a an excavator yes. and go in there and do a clean out of the lagoon to the way it is now and put that sucker back on uh, turn to go ahead and utilize it to to take care of our immediate problem by this time to go ahead and build the new lagoon to go ahead and handle the long-term problem so I don't know that we can do that on this item but you know the presentation. I, I think that if you took uh, you know, we're addressing the same thing with material. It's just I a report. That we go ahead and research the most economical way to clean out the existing lagoon and bring it to us in another item in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, the good thing is, you know, we have a, a, a decent budget, you know, 666,000 of these guys October 1st. So, I mean, we have to be applying all these assets. Or would you keep thinking it's only money? Well, it's the ordinary. Okay, let's keep on moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, yeah, the last item was just an update from our meeting. Yes. We had an excellent number. I don't know if you'd like to say anything about it. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's just we did get the loan commitment on uh, September 20th, and we're on schedule with closing December 19th. And we're looking at getting closing done by the end of the month. Uh, we have a couple of things we need to get done. One is we need to get the site cleaned up to get it ready for construction. We need to get the engineering procured for construction management, the social link and construction, and the location design things. So I'll have to get those RFPs out ASAP. Um, to stay on schedule, we have to select the award engineer in November and then award the contract in December. But that's, that's basically the two critical points, you know, just stay on December closing for the 18 limitations and the sludge holding. Also, I, I would just like to add that we really should utilize the development water, the, wa the development water board for more resources and funding and grant applications. We're, we're, we're not using it to the fullest capacity. Uh, of what they offer for grants and, and what they offer for financing. Uh, and they are eager and willing to work with us on any level and basically any size project. Uh, they're very progressive and they have a very good board and they have an excellent staff and team. Uh, and I've known that too, but for uh, financing such as the meters, uh, some sludge lagoon, some of these things, we can, we can get some really preferred financing and apply for grant money uh, and, and open up us for other opportunities to keep advancing in the district. So, just wanted to state that. Who's the report? Unless there's other questions. Thank you guys for taking care of that. Yes.
Thank you. Moving forward, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Moving to item eight, presentation by Texas County and District Retirement System on Employees Retirement Plan and Benefits for the Lagoon Monterey Water District. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have Erica Nieto, our representative thank you. Thank you. from the Texas Retirement. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. <coughs> My name is Erica Nieto, and I come to you from Austin, Texas. I am your employer services representative with TCDRS, and it is my responsibility to provide accurate data and resources and answer questions you have about your plan. So I put together a brief presentation. I printed it for your records, but I also have it uh, on PowerPoint to highlight certain very important points of funding our portfolio, and then to speak to our system stability um, as far as statewide is concerned. I'd like to begin by pointing out the very first slide, and that is that we are extremely unique as a pension system. So you may be privy to information that you hear in the news of other systems, even in our own state, that are funded differently than we are. And the three characteristics that separate TCDRS from any other pension system is that we're savings-based. What that means is that employees are required to put a percent in their own accounts each month. No contribution holidays. They must pay into their own account. While that is happening over the course of their career, the district is paying a percent of payroll. They are required to pay as set by our actuaries, to fund the match. And this process occurs all year long over the course of every employee's career. Therefore, the way the plan is designed is the money will be there for each individual member when they hit eligibility and choose to retire. The second characteristic is that we are responsibly funded. What that means is our actuaries study your plan every year, not every four years, not every three years, they study your plan every year. From January 1 until March 31, they are fine combing through your plan. They're looking at, did your payroll increase or de decrease? How many people retired? How many people are now eligible to retire? Who terminated? How many people withdrew their money and forfeited the match? They're looking at all the plan experience. With that said, they also look at our investment returns. In a moment, I'm going to talk to you about how that drives our success, our portfolio. They look at our returns, and based on how we did in the market and what gains we can pass off to the employers, along with the plan experience, that's how they determine the percent of payroll that will responsibly fund your plan. And that happens every year. So they know the specific behavior to this district on how to responsibly fund your plan. Third characteristic is why I'm here tonight. You are the directors that determine your benefit levels that you can afford. And you have the flexibility and local control every year to adjust that. And what separates us is that in other systems, the benefits are blanketed. In our system, they're not. Every district in every county determines their own level of benefits based on what they can afford every year. And these three characteristics are what completely separate us from other systems that you see nationwide and that you see in our own state. To give you a snapshot, we have nearly 300,000 members. Every county in Texas is part of our system except Motley. Every other county is. And districts join us each month. Appraisal, navigation, hospital, irrigation, you name it. If they're a governmental entity that cannot participate as a municipality, then they likely can join our system. And so we grow each month and each year by about 20 districts a year. And so we are uh, a little over 760 employers in all the counties, 253, because we don't have Molly, and then the, the other difference are employers, our districts, and that's how we grow. We have $30 billion in assets as a system. That is the only time money is pulled, is for investment purposes only. Your members fund their own retirement. Your district funds its own match. There is no cost sharing in our system whatsoever. You never fund someone else's district or county plan. It's not, it can't even happen. There's no cost sharing. 
We only pool our assets for portfolio purposes only, and in a moment I'm going to discuss our performance, our history, and our future. As a system, we're nearly 90% funded, and our 35-year return has been 9.1, and I'll speak to our, our return in a moment. I included this slide because I wanted to point out how TCDRS is a cyclical system. It not only supports the retirees, but it supports your local community. Last year alone, we paid over $14 million to zip codes in Cameron County. And what's interesting about that statistic is that every four years, we do economic impact studies. We want to know where are, we, are our retirees living? Where are they spending their money? We find that 96% of people like this state, and only 4% leave, but 96% are staying in their own local communities. So what's happening to these retirement checks? They're putting the money back into their local community. And it's very important that we keep an eye on that because we want to know how the retirees are then benefiting the state of Texas. I'd like to look at your benefit levels as a whole. This is the local control that your district has every year. You can choose to adjust what the employees deposit in a range anywhere from 4% to 7%. That's our state statute. You currently are at 7%. That's system-wide average. That's actually what TCD is. Our employees participate in as well, 7%. If you ever wanted to adjust that, you could to five, six, five, or four. But those are the four levels by our state statute. The match rate begins at dollar for dollar, which is 100%, as high as 250%, which is $2.50 for every dollar. This district is system-wide average at 200. That is actually what most employers in our system match their employees at. Your vesting level is eight. That is system-wide average. And your eligibility rules are 60 and 8, the rule of 75 and 20, all system-wide average. If you ever needed to adjust those, you could accordingly. And currently, you offer partial lump sum. It just means that when your members are eligible to retire, they can take out a lump sum of their own money and retire off the difference. But that's a choice. They don't have to, because you offer that as a choice. If, let's say, they had medical expenses or wanted to take a trip in retirement, they could access a portion of their own money and then retire off the match of the difference. This is a glimpse of your current benefit levels. Now, I mentioned that we study your plan. We do that in great detail every year. We take a snapshot on December 31st, and for three months, we study what happened at this district over the last year. Did their payroll increase or decrease? What is all of the activity going on? How many people are reaching that eligibility? How many 20-year-olds did they just hire who have a career to fund their retirement? So we study what happened and then we look at our investment returns. In 2017, we closed the year at 14.7%. We passed off 13% of gains to our employers. The difference we put in a reserves fund. The reserves fund is very important. We used $4 billion of reserves in 2008 when the market crashed. So it's very important for TCDRS to have a reserve fund for those uh, difficult market years. When we studied your plan, we determined that for 2019, to appropriately fund your plan, your percent of payroll will be 14.39. By paying this, you're doing two things. You're paying off all your current employees' future benefits. That's what liabilities means in our system. All liabilities are our future benefits owed. That's what it means. And you're paying all this down in a closed 20-year amortization period. That was said in statute because we don't want to pass off debt to future generations, so we amortize it in a closed 20-year period. Outside rating agencies that have nothing to do with us, like Fitch and S&P, they rate all systems. They rate the health of the system at 80% funded and higher. And you are currently at 84.9% funded as of December 31st, 2017, which is considered very healthy. I want to point out to you the reasons for rate change, because as I said, we study your plan and there are reasons that your rate is impacted. When you see a negative sign, that actually means a positive experience. So your investment return, that was positive because we closed the year at 14.7, passing off gains. And you see assumptions and methods, that's positive. We adjust our mortality tables and our APR rates to match the current life expectancies of males and females. And women are outliving men, so we had to adjust that accordingly. Well, your district is very male heavy, and so that was a plus for you. You didn't have very many women, so there was a gain for you. The, the impact that you see that's not a positive. I think I ought to rephrase that. Be politically correct. 
oh, to be, to, you have more males than females. Let's well, no, you have more males than females, but you know, it's not a positive in that sense. Oh, I see what you're saying. Absolutely. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Certainly, that, that's just a, just a fact is that you have more males than females. I, I get you. Thank no, you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The demographic and other changes, I um, actually studied that for you. What happened is that your payroll was less than you predicted, which means that you had people terminate or leave employment in a larger number than we, pro we projected for you. So when we look at your payroll, we say, this is the size of their payroll, we look at their history, and we predict how your payroll will be for the following year, and people terminate it, so your payroll shrunk. Um, and it, it didn't replace itself in that given year, so there was a, a little impact to that that you see called demographic and other changes. But again, we study your plan each year, and so it balances itself out as the payroll repairs itself and your, your team grows. This is a reflection of how you make the call as decision makers. If you were to adjust benefit levels, you can see how you have a range between the employee deposit rate and then the matching rate. And again, this is where we share the risk. We share the risk in that we manage the portfolio. With our $30 billion asset pool, we have the best managed investment managers that we can afford. And we have very diligent, watchful eye on how that portfolio performs that I'll show you in a moment. The shared risk is that if your um, percent of payroll needs to be adjusted, you have the local control to do so in any given year to meet your workforce needs and budgets. Together, we can make adjustments that is ever healthy or what is need be for your district based on what you see here in this chart. Some districts don't make changes for a while. They just let things occur. Others do make adjustments. But that's the, that's the ability that we have in our system that other pension systems don't have because they have blanket decisions for all decision makers. How, how does that process work? What, what, what initiates that? So, for example, if you're interested in making an adjustment, I would uh, create... How, how would we recognize that? I mean, what, what are we looking for that we say, okay, we need to make an adjustment? Okay, so for the screen, I can give you an example. Let's say, for example, for 2019, your percent of payroll that we projected to pay is 14.39. Let's say you would like to pay uh, less than that to meet your budget, and you wanted to decrease the match to 175%. Your rate would go from 14.39 to 13.15, for example, purposes. So when counties or districts say you want to increase the match, I can say, okay, what would you like to increase the match to? And we would adjust it. If they say, Erica, we would like to experience a cost savings and decrease, then we would look at what your range of possibility is. I just had a district call me yesterday. They want to increase the match to 225%. So their percent of payroll would change because that's a benefit increase. So really it's whatever the philosophy of the board is and what interest you have. Do you want to make benefit changes? Do you want to adjust your what your costs are? Whatever interest you have, you then approach me, and I can run you figures on what Are there economic have. factors that dictate that, or you're losing employees too quick? What? That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. Well, I think we need to go back in, in the page before, sorry to interrupt, but to look at, we're, we're unfunded. We're underfunded <coughs> to 15%. 15%. But we did 15, make an adjustment last We year. did. We did. We did. Well, no, they did it for us. Well, basically, oh, I remember that story. They did it for us, yeah. but yeah. what you're asking is, if we're going to make have that discussion, we're really 15 percent underfunded, and that we need to know that dollar amount. So, if we were wanting to take and catch up better, then we would consider, you know, matching 225 or 250, and paying a more percentage to where we get caught up to where we're fully funded. But as I recall, we're making some bonus payments this coming year, $300,000, correct? Correct. How does that reflect? So that's a funded liability. Yes, do you have to speak we're, Yes, we're gonna make a one-time uh, uh, payment, uh, which has been <coughs> budgeted for the coming fiscal year. So I'd like to point you to this document I provided called the plan assessment, and I'd like to explain your point on funding and this additional money that you're sending. So this is called the plan assessment. We send this to you every April. This is after we find from your plan and study it and determine what experience occurred, how did we do in the market, and now what do you owe. So this happens every April. So I'd like to point out at the bottom of the page, you have your assets and your liabilities. It's the very bottom of the page. The word unfunded in our system is a misnomer. It's not true that you're unfunded. You are responsibly funding your plan by paying your rate. 
but from a financial GASB perspective, from an actuarial term, they require that we use the word unfunded because your members haven't retired yet. If so it all stopped today, today, if it all stopped today, that's what you'd be sure. If it all stopped today, sir, if you close your doors tonight, then you would owe the funding so that everybody gets a retirement. Absolutely. But the way retirement works is we're funding it over the course of their career. So as long as you pay in a timely manner, like if I pay my mortgage to the bank, I'm considered it's a healthy asset because I'm paying it each month. You're paying it over time what's required, and you're paying what we tell you to pay, which is different from other pension systems. We have a required rate. ERS and TRS do not. We do. And that's what separates us. So unfunded is a misnomer. However, the benefits haven't been paid yet. They're still working, so they're paid in the future. So if you want a quick glance at your assets, they're right here and your liabilities, when we take the difference, it's $2 million. And so your funded ratio is the difference between your assets and your liabilities, which is 84.9. And that's considered very healthy, anything above 80%. To your point, Chairman, if you were to close your doors, you would want to fund it in full, but your doors are not closing tomorrow. You have the time on your side to fund it over the course of their career. Now, the way TC Darris is structured, we designed this study to get you to be 100% funded over time. We want you to be 100% funded. The reason you aren't 100% funded today, a few reasons. When you bring new employees in, you have to start paying for their retirement. They're brand new. So those are brand new future benefits that are owed. Another thing is if you have a, a benefit increase. For example, in your, I also provided your history. I thought you all would want a quick glance at your history. In your district's history, you've passed three polls for retirees. A poll in our system is not cost of living for employees. It's for retirees only. And the cost of a COLA is financed. It takes 15 years to pay off a COLA. And so you're currently, the last COLA you passed was in 2009, and you're still paying for that. You can pay for it up front if you'd like. If ever you want to pass a future COLA, I would gladly give you the dollar amount if you want to prefund it. But these weren't prefunded back in 2009, so they're, they're rolled into the cost of the rate, and you pay for them 15th at a time over 15 years. That's why the rate has increased a little bit. The goal is to become 100% funded, however, I want to be very clear that the way we're designed, just by paying your rate, you are responsibly funding this plan. Okay. The word unfunded is a misnomer. Okay. And so it's we speak to the legislature about this very often because we don't receive any state funding. Not not one penny from the state of Texas. Not anything. We are self-funded by our investments, our employers, and our members. And so for GASB financial reporting purposes, they make us use the word unfunded because the benefits haven't been paid yet. So this is really what we're looking at. This is a very healthy document because you get to see your assets, your liabilities, what your rate is, and then you get to see your benefit levels. And on the back is really that slide that I showed earlier, the reasons for why your rate has changed over time. Um, the payroll, the salary variation that employees are leaving has been a little bit of a factor because your payroll shrunk two consecutive years in a row. And that was something that we didn't predict that it would shrink that way. So that was a little bit of a factor. but. When we restudy your plan, then we get a new understanding of your payroll size, and we um, we value it accordingly. So we ask a question to finance first. Then why are we making a three hundred thousand dollar additional payment this year when she tells me that we're doing okay at eighty four percent? Well, frankly, because you guys asked for to you know to get to you wanted to increase the amount of funding. Um, you know, to to decrease that unfunded liability. Well, but so I was led. I, frankly, I, we were told we were unfunded. But I thought the loan was one hundred and ten thousand. Well, that's what I was led to understand. It wasn't three hundred. No, it's three hundred. You, I remember three, me three. and you voted on it. Yeah, we were three hundred. But you know, that's what I was already hearing. We got a three million dollar unfunded liability. Yeah. And, and so we were trying to catch up. That's why we said. Uh, what happened is that the uh, previous board members that were here, they made it like a big item, like unfunded. We owe, we owe, we owe. And well, that's well, where it came about. Well, you know, I was one I was <coughs> one of them do. But we've got three years. The last page that you have there is showing three years. We we caught up six percent. Yeah, yeah. By doing they that. should like in twenty years, as Robert Gomez had explained a while back, that in twenty years we should catch up with everything. <coughs> but we Thank you. As I guess the board decided. I'm sorry. As long as we don't have the rate of turnover that we have been having, or the or, polls, or the polls, the, the retirement. Yeah. Right. We had a lot of retired too that, yeah. that hit the system pretty hard. I, I would like to, to comment on 
on the uh, act, um, additional contribution. So additional contributions are actually healthy. They're considered proactive measures to increase assets. So what that means is among your flexibility and local control and paying your rate, you have the ability to pay more toward your assets to lower the liabilities and increase the assets. So is it required? No. But why is it considered proactive and healthy? I'll tell you why. When we have tough markets like we did in 2008 and you have higher assets and less liabilities, your rate doesn't spike up because you have higher assets to liabilities. So is it required? No, because you're responsibly funded. But am I witnessing more districts and counties make additional contributions? Absolutely. Because 2008 scared people. It didn't, they didn't like what happened to the market. So what they have done is they've asked us as a system, how can we be more proactive? What should we do? We said, well, you're healthy, but pay them down faster. So that when we have adverse experiences in the market, you're in a better standing, you're closer to the 90% funded range, and therefore your rate in a given year doesn't spike too much. Now, we as a system have controls in place. We have smoothing, we have amortization, we have reserves. I assure you we're doing our part to make sure we work with our employers so that they don't see a rate spike, but we can't control everything. So we share the, the proactive uh, capabilities by saying, if you have the extra money, when you can, help increase those assets and, and lower the liabilities as a way of really building a cushion for adverse experience. So um, I wasn't present when that discussion took place, but I will share that this past year, I have given more talks on making additional contributions than in our history, because county judges and board of directors are saying, what more can we do? And while it's, you're healthy, you're not considered unfunded by paying it responsibly, it's just an added approach to really create a cushion. So it's not a horrible thing, it's, it's a proactive strategy, but you're not less of, you're not less funded if you don't. So if you do, we run the numbers, it will increase your funding ratio higher to 87%. So the, so the employees at retirement, they get a, a I'm gonna say a, a average or a, a prorated rate. I'm looking for the word. If, if we have an employee, whatever their salary is, they're gonna get in a retirement at that. Is there any level that we get it fully funded or say we're at 110% funded, do the employees get a higher retirement? They don't, so benefits and funding are separate. So to your point, we are a cash balance system. I really appreciate you asking that question. We're a cash balance system. When John Smith is ready to retire, we look at how much is in his account with his interest earned, because his account is earning 7% interest by state law. Then it's matched by this water district. So now he has one pile of money. It's his own money with the interest with the match. Then we look at his age to determine a life expectancy. That's how we determine the amount. So if you fund higher, so it's all it doesn't change when he's getting all his cash balance system. What the funding does is put this district in a comfortable place that if you were to ever close your doors, or should anything happen, you have a cushion and you're well funded. I'd like to also say I have districts that don't pay us a required rate anymore because they're already 100% funded. They don't owe us anything. Now when they start bringing on new employees, then maybe they'll owe us a little something because like I said, when you bring new people on, you haven't funded them yet. But if they It don't, takes eight years for them to become funded. It take, well, it could be sooner. It takes year, eight years for them to become vested. Yeah. But the funding, um, that could be a little vested. quicker because if you're making additional payments or you're doing proactive strategies, oh, you'll fund them faster. But the, um, I have districts that don't pay us anything each month because they're already 100%. They like to stay between 100 and 102. They're appraisal districts because sometimes they think they're going to become assumed. That's just their perspective. They like to be higher funded. But over 80 is very healthy. And um, my job is to come as often as you'd like to give you updates on how we're doing as a system, how are we funded, how are we doing in the market. And I'd like to show you how we're doing in the market. This slide, though, is going to address what I just said. We don't receive money from the state of Texas, which is wonderful, because we're not a part of those budget discussions. So there's no money they can take from us because they don't give it to us. Every benefit dollar that's paid out to a retiree, 77 cents comes from our investment earnings. 13 cents comes from you, the employer, and 10 cents comes from the member's own pocket. So this is how we're funded. Our portfolio has six different asset classes. So we're diverse across and within. And three years ago, we designed and dedicated an entire section of our website, because all of this is public information. You can see who our managers are, what they're doing on a year-to-date return. You can see anything you've ever wanted to know. Even better, you can always email me a question and I will have an actual investment manager get back to you if you're ever curious about how we're doing on a particular asset class. 
this is our return in the last 35 years. So we have our fund, and then we have the benchmark, which is the general benchmark in the country that we <coughs> compare ourselves to. In all years and all periods, we exceeded our benchmarks. Our goal is an 8% return, but we know we're not going to hit 8 we know that sometimes we're going to be over or under, and this is what it looks like. That brown line you see, that's our goal, the 8%. Over time, we've hit within our risk tolerance. That's the gray band. Our investment portfolio is designed to include a plus or minus 12% in any given year. And these are our actual returns where we exceeded it or we came just beneath it. And the only two times we didn't stay in that risk tolerance was the great recession of 08 and the subsequent recovery in 2009. You clearly see us outside of the bandwidth, but the portfolio is performed as expected within that risk tolerance. So we know we're not going to hit our eight every year, which we don't chase annual returns, but we do look at are we exceeding our benchmarks? Are we hitting our goal long term? And because the average employee works about 17 years in our system and is retired another 20, we have time on our side to allow for that risk tolerance to take place within our own portfolio. Um, I do want to just mention something quickly is that we encourage that when a member terminates, that they truly terminate to move on, that they don't pull their money and come right back to the same employer. Um, the IRS does not appreciate that. They find that to be a version of collusion because they're pulling out their retirement and coming right back to the same employer. So we have some um, tools in place to make sure that it's bona fide, it's a true separation. And this is also for retirees. So if you have people retire, don't have any discussions with them about bringing them right back. They need to retire and enjoy their new chapter of life, not to come right back here. Can they come later? Sure. If, if retirement isn't what they thought, the grass wasn't as green and they wanted to come back. But not, not under, with intention, not with their position being held. That's collusion. And we are a tax-deferred qualified plan. And if the IRS finds us in contempt of collusion, they'll take away our tax-deferred status. So we protect it very much. So I just like to mention that because we often get calls from um, employers saying, can I rehire this retiree? They retired last month and they want to come back. And no, you shouldn't. You need to let them be retired for a while. And after the grass isn't green for a while, then they can come back. Give them at least six months, just so that there's no question about the IRS. Um, this, this presentation is generally brief, but I do want to say that my responsibility is to make sure that any time you need information from TCDRS, you get it immediately. That's my job. And so as you have a chance to review the plan assessment or your history or any part of the presentation thereof, I've provided my business card in every one of your folders. And I assure you that if I'm traveling, you'll get my out of office, but you will hear from me immediately. And if you are curious about speaking with an investment manager or anybody in between, I will get you in touch with the responsible party who can give you detail <coughs> if I cannot. Your uh, decision making can happen any time of the year. All plan changes are due by December for the following year. And so if there are questions about these plan updates or changes, simply visit with, um, of course, Mr. Gumbon and I will help him run what that looks like. If ever you're curious on specific benefit costs like a future COLA, I can tell you what that costs. And you have options of pre-funding it so that you don't have to finance it for 15 years, those kinds of things. Um, my region has become the valley as of four years ago. I was in here in 2009. But I have a close working relationship with Mr. Galvan and your team, and I am going to make myself available as often as you'd like. It is my personal goal that you understand this plan very well. We are unique, we are well funded, and we have a history of excellence. And I want to make sure you know how that plan works since you're providing it to your members. And so however I can be helpful, please know that that's my job, and, and I'll, I'll take it very seriously. And I'm also happy to answer any questions that you have um, about what I addressed or anything beyond that. I appreciate the presentation. I have a much clearer understanding mm -hmm. saying that I would like to see an agenda item on the next meeting to discuss this uh, plan $300,000 co additional contribution. You talking about a budget amendment? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's that, both in the door or not? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. The 300. Well, we're we're getting out of the scope yes. of conversation on this agenda item or presentation now. So it is a presentation, and there are several. We'll put it as an agenda next item. There are many ways that she discussed that you that it can go. Oh, yeah. It's money that's owed. It's either getting ahead or getting just keeping up. So you have to decide which one you want to do. You owe the money regardless, and to avoid future spikes and what the rates you're paying, 
then you pay that additional lump sum of money to avoid that for the future. It's money that's owed, so whether you choose to pay it or not pay it, you will pay it eventually. Yeah, I can you tell you I'm not in favor of kicking the can <coughs> down the road. And, and that's all you're doing. But, but, what, that's, but what she has told us, that at the rate we're paying, we, we are, are making a slow grab into that yes. deficit. We are comfortable, <coughs> yes. Regardless of the additional payments. There are several, there are, it's investment strategy. Yeah. It's all different ways you can look at it. It's, so there is no right or wrong answer. No. It's the philosophy of your board, and yes. we're going to give you options. So I, I'm not trying to divert it. it and I, I understand the investments, but. Thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. You, you worded it perfectly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And I was surprised that the water district made a 200% contribution. That's extremely healthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. That I hope the employee, employees see as one of those benefits down the road. Yes, the, I know that the employees uh, appreciate that. It is keeping longevity are. and retention. Yeah. Yes. It is, it is yeah. keeping what we have in longevity yeah. and retention, that's for sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank an you. excellent presentation. Thank you. Very, very well spoken. Very well said. <clears throat> I'd like to carry on. Thank you. Moving to... Thank you, Mary. Sorry. Moving to item number a nine, consider and discuss for possible approval of a resolution amending the Lagoon Rotary Water District rates for water, <coughs> wastewater, and raw water and financial plan. Resolution number 165-09-18. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, this uh, resolution follows the recommendations from our, our rate study. Uh, I've adjusted the, uh, the first year of implementation uh, for, for the, the rates uh, to uh, push, I push them back to uh, the November to allow uh, for approximately 30 days of notice. So if, we're, if, if you choose to adopt today, uh, that would give us uh, uh, about 30 days um, to, uh, to notify everybody about the rate change. Uh, before those uh, go into effect, and they would be reflected in uh, our uh, customers' uh, November bills. We <coughs> discussed this quite a bit, had a lot of input. Our council has been involved with some discussions with some interested parties. Discuss with us an executive session. I, I, possibly, and it'll be very quick. We have the capacity to. At any point. At any point, you know, I'm. The catch all at the I individually, as a board member, I'm well <coughs> prepared to, you know, I cover wanna, all the bases. I just want to discuss the last uh, communication I received. From council representing. Is that your recommendation? Yes. I, we go give, me, session? give me three minutes in executive session. I'll, I'll make a motion. We go in executive session. Second. Motion made by D. Wells to go in executive session at 6.57 p.m. Second made by R. Wells. Are all those in favor? Aye. Aye. If they are, we go to executive Aye. session pending a three minute. Need a motion to come out of executive session at 7.15 p.m. So, so moved. Question made by, uh, I did not catch that, was that? Uh, I second. Mr. Avalos. Avalos. And seconded Avalos. by D. Wells. Are all those in favor? Aye. Aye. They are. We're in executive session. Uh, motion to proceed. Go for it. Please uh, do. Did it off my time. I guess we have to take a uh, action of executive session. Right? No. Why don't you just go to the no, action? No, it wasn't. I don't know. Okay. Know. Moving on to item number nine, consider and discuss for possible approval of resolution amending the Lagoon Boundary Water District rates for water, wastewater, and raw water and financial plan. Resolution number 165-09-18. Okay. Mr. Council, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Is this district under any obligation to sell raw water? For the record, council said no. Need a uh, motion, consider, and discuss for possible approval of a resolution amending the Lagoon Water District. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 165 09 18. 
Second. Motion made by Mr. Avalo, seconded by uh, Mr. Houston. I would also, uh, are all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Opposed. For the record, uh, Mr. Wells opposes. I the would like. Rick Wells. For the, uh, for the motion, R. Wells opposes. I would like for notice to be made that council to continue to work with uh, the uh, current council in discussion uh, and in and discussing the ongoing uh, issues. Okay. Not necessarily issues, but we'll discuss with uh, the council of the golf course for options for contractual uh, agreements. Yes, sir. Moving forward to item number 10, consider and discuss for possible approval of travel and training budget for board <coughs> members. This is uh, uh, a recommendation from the budget committee for uh, to increase uh, uh, transparency for board uh, travel and training. Um, the, uh, they requested a, a line item um, to separate uh, travel and training from where it's currently being expensed in the administration travel and training. Uh, so this is a, it would be an amendment to next year's uh, budget, which was adopted at the last uh, uh, meeting. Yes, I would like to add in there that uh, if a board member travels not for uh, Traveling to Austin, such as Texas Water Development Board, or the such, not really be included in this, so that it doesn't deduct from it. It's, that's district business, not district training and travel. Does that make sense? Any board member that goes, I didn't really have time after I thought about that, but such as last week when I went to Austin with Charles, I don't want that to count against any board member that goes. Well, it would be approved. It would be approved. All these are approved by, this is just right. kind of a, a baseline, a, a if you will. A dollar baseline. A yeah. dollar baseline, and it's it's a 15,000 is, so that we can kind of okay. keep a basis there. And if somebody needs to take them to over that amount, it Board approves it still. Yeah. Okay, and just want to make sure going that's there. It just kind of puts it in the right uh, area to give more accountability. Know, uh, Part of the reason that uh, I wanted to look at this and review this was not so much to set a budget, but in a sense we are setting the budget, but more than anything is uh, when I looked at that item, there was no backup material. When I called Mr. Galvan, he kind of knew what was going on. He knew what was going on, but I said, we need information in the package, okay? I need to know why we're doing this, you know, and consequently I called you. No, no, I, I'm not objecting or opposing so, anything. So I just uh, wanted to. The point is, the point is, my point is that I do not, I'm not, I don't want to do this to to question anybody's authority on trap or, <coughs> or, or, or limit train, or limit for that matter. But I do want transparency. I want a memo, and in they're indicating why we're doing this. Sure. Why anybody's doing well, it? Well, that's because this is this is not just to serve me. This is to serve the public as well. This is public information. Under, this agenda, under the agenda on. item, we just got to take and do a budget adjustment, and if we want to have further discussion on yeah. the purposes of why and what beyond what we discussed here, that would be another agenda item, you know, discussing travel. It would be an amendment to the policy that we have in place now. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to keep that conversation separate from this agenda item. And I would suggest that the chairman needs more than... We discussed that, but you know he's just a just a director. Well, he's here's not a, here's representing us in any other capacity. If he needs to represent the chairman, needs to represent us, or any other, or any board member, they simply get approval. Yep. That's and fine. Yeah. It, it was it's not the same. I just wanted. I just wanted yeah. to clear that. that no, 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 no. There's going to AWBD and, and right. going no. to Texas Water Development. The other thing I want to point doesn't get limited, so we're not what? tapped out. In, no, no, no. In the box that we have. <coughs> in here, I I I want to strike the names off of place one, place two, place three, place four. It's just a director place one, director place two, director place three or four right. or five. Yeah, it's, it's not it's the names of the individual. The yeah. next place yeah. member or whatever, yeah. whatever that is. Yeah. A director. Yes, I can do that. A director. <coughs> okay, that's all. Is there a motion? Hey, let me ask you this. You have to get split checks now. What do you mean? Well, when no, you go to a restaurant. I mean, I'm serious. Oh, yes. Technically, you're supposed to. Yes. Or you can take it off your account. 
<laughs> Motion approved. Motion made by D. Wells. Second. With the, Second with the correction, with the change made. With the proposed changes. Yes. Sure. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. There are any opposed on motion carries. Thank you. Moving to 11. Uh, consider and discuss for possible approval of consulting agreement for IT <coughs> services with G5 Internet Services. So this is a, uh, a renewal uh, of, the, uh, of the current agreement in place. Uh, so the, the terms of this agreement is uh, for one year with an option, <coughs> a district option to renew for an additional year. Just the same price as last year, basically. Basically. Uh, so it's optional one year to put a 3% yeah. cost of living. Basically, it's, uh, it is. It's a 3% uh, uh, increase. Starting, uh, starting, uh, starting if, if, the, if the option is exercised a year from now. Oh, okay, this, but this year it'll be the same. Yes, the, the, same. The, the, the price here is uh, is 3% more than we pay in the current year. So, so, so the next, this next year will be 3% more than? Correct. 3% already this year, in other words. And it'll be another 3% next year. Correct. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, is it uh, standard procedure, I guess, to do, uh, to give a contractor a cost of living increase, since he's not considered an employee? So, uh, my understanding is the way this is, this, uh, well, is that standard? Yeah, because because the back here mm -hmm. it says G five is not considered an agent or employee of the district for any purpose and is not entitled to any of the benefits provided by the district to the <coughs> district employees, such as a cost of living increase. So if you don't yeah. call if you I don't call it a cost of living, it will just call it something else. Cost of service. <laughs> right, I know, yeah. but it's cost indicated in the contract as a cost of living increase. Yeah, it, it should not be a cost of living increase. It should just be a three pre pre increase. Cost of services increase. So, so you, you want to strike that from yeah, the language, you're, why you're, language, the cost of living increase? And if you're on, the, you're on A, they're under term? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. fix the typo, October 1,218 <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, we we went over last year on this agreement. You weren't here, and it was it was really bad then. It's not very good now. Written agreement typos. So somebody take the time to clean it up. Uh, and that and that is the conversation I want to have. Is we can do it on this agenda item because right now I see the district's needs not just for IT services but for internet services in general growing much beyond with our new automatic meter system i need this person to be well versed in everything i think we're we've outgrown this agreement and we need to look in at you know hiring somebody in-house as a full-time employee problem with or that is or we get into each time we do this we're 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 getting into a rfq situation that we're not following so i have a little <coughs> questions here with legal that we're just taking a contract without you know, getting proposals or requests. Hiring someone in-house is an excellent idea, but unfortunately, this position is probably one of the highest turnover rates that there is out there right now. And, and this contract doesn't guarantee yes. anything different? No, it doesn't, but it guarantees you have a company that provides service. Yeah, but, you know, I guarantee if Rolando left there in deep doo-doo, just like we are. So, I, at another time beyond that, uh, I'd... I just with this agreement I just want to make sure I put notes on here you know when we get into under B we get down to the bottom of it you know make sure that everything that the district may need is is included in this you know so I would add another paragraph in to say something to effectively any and any other related needs a district may need you know just some catch-all that you know I think we he's ask got you that in there. no it's not and, uh, you know, and the others in here, I just want to make sure that, you know, we have enough protection in the agreement that, you know, takes care of the district, that we have full access and control of this individual. The, uh, the other uh, question I had is uh, uh, how standard or how common is it to have the uh, uh, agreement uh, be terminated on a 60-day period? 
Is that standard? Be anything um, you want. I have not evaluated other. other uh, and I guess what I the reason I, I uh, contractors I wouldn't be able to. The reason I was thinking about that is because then we're obligated for past sixty days of of, uh, of uh, or or sixty days future sixty future days, 60 days of, of uh, payments. Uh, and if we can amend that to 30 days, I'd be happier with a 30-day termination. I think that's adequate time. I believe that's it's just a suggestion. I, I don't know how the I think it's all right under that. this agenda item since we're talking about IT services. Yeah. I would like the staff, Mr. Galvan, to go ahead and look at you know a session. Assessing the overall needs of the district for internet and internet services and, and everything related to that. Okay. And let's kind of get a handle on where we are. I, I really see this district growing into a different yes. Yes. technological age, <clears throat> not just for this individual, but I would like to make sure that we're getting the best internet service that we can right. and we accomplish uh, everything that the district needs in the future and this person needs to be well versed on the AMI system and not just in house here but elsewhere in the field if we well, have I to take and maintain the, it. To me that's the issue or the, the question is uh, is the service work rate right. getting from G5 how does that connect or how does that help us or how does that work with the new because uh, somebody else is going to be monitoring that cloud system for us you know so they won't be monitoring the cloud system. That's automatic, but somebody's going to have to monitor our, our radio collection, our data collection we're, antennas we're and everything. We're a lot more uh, <coughs> infrastructure uh, equipment right. and uh, uh, technology that uh, uh, needs to be physically uh, monitored. Uh, and so our technology needs are going to increase uh, with this new metering system. Yep. I make a motion to approve the agreement uh, with the typos corrected and to make sure staff uh, evaluates that any all needs are addressed for the district in here. And then Mr. Avalo suggested a 30-day termination instead of a 60-day. I do have another comment before I, I, I'll second that. Um, on, uh, well, just page, say it and I'll include it. Just page four. Uh, basically what it is is uh, item number uh, under conduct, conduct of G5 and confidentiality, the second paragraph uh, at the bottom, at the end of that paragraph, is authorized, uh, is it the, obtained by G5 in performance of the agreement to any third unrelated party unless authorized in writing by a district's general manager or finance director. Do, do we need to have the finance director in there as well? Because you're going to have to authorize whatever you, you're going to do through the general manager, wouldn't you? Does that make sense, or you, are you suggesting strike finance director? I, I'm, well, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about it, but I would I would assume that the, the finance director would have to. I'd rather, I'd rather the general manager speak the for the district anyway. in all matters. That's fine. Is that is that correct, or I mean, you wouldn't be able to. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. So that's added to my motion. Okay, okay. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Chairman? No. Need no. a motion? We Let's had it. We, okay. we made it. We got a second. Thank you. We're ready to Moving vote. To, we need uh, a vote. Need a motion to <laughs> we made a I made a motion for the changes we talked about. Okay, thank you. Motion and then by Alex by seconded and now we're ready for a vote. Motion made by D. Well, seconded by Mr. Alvaros. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. There are any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving to uh, item 12, consider and discuss for possible approval method of financing for AMI meter project. So um, this is a, uh, a follow-up to a few different discussions. We've uh, discussed this uh, financing for the meter project in, in parts. We discussed uh, fund balance on August uh, 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 22nd, then followed that up with uh, a comparison of, uh, of uh, paying for meters in cash versus uh, paying for them uh, uh, from uh, paying for them in cash out of fund, fund balance versus uh, financing them um, at, on the 12th. And uh, the, the, the fact remains that uh, 
the, the plan that we had uh, to finance through private placement, um, that is still being uh, held up under TCQ uh, review. Uh, so currently financing has not been secured uh, for, for this project. Uh, on July 11th, the board authorized the district to begin to use district funds and seek reimbursement from those uh, tax <coughs> obligation, uh, those, uh, those uh, bonds to be issued, the private placement bonds to be issued. Um, and then recently we had the conversation with Tech Squad Development Board where they uh, advised us that they could uh, possibly finance that. So we have a few different options and we just wanted the, the board to, to uh, give us some direction as far as what, uh, uh, what method of financing to, to, to pursue. Um, uh, so A, the, the cash payment from, from the fund balance, B, the private placement revenue bonds, uh, or the C, the, the Texas Water Development Board uh, loan. I, th I thank uh, the staff and chairman especially for coming back with the TWDB information. Yeah. And at the 1.5% that they were talking about, that's less than the stated national inflation rate. So I don't see how you can go wrong with that. So I'll make the motion that we go with the, the TWDB yeah. long round. Sure. Okay. okay. That, may I say something? On one other thing on the Texas Water Development Board financing, it will set us back uh, about two months. Is that right? Uh, yeah, depending on, well, that was the... But not necessarily. No. Yeah, because I don't think we're going to no. uh, accomplish anything with uh, rebidding no. or changing our procurement right. method. Um, we're going to do the non-equivalency. Yeah. It would require yeah. us to bring another resolution to uh, change the wording. Uh, so uh, that July 11th motion that uh, we adopted that resolution to reimburse the, the, the district for um, um, from the, uh, the bonds that were going to be issued, that language is going to have to change. Uh, um, so it will be a similar resolution. From but it'll be private a, placement uh, yes. to... To Texas, Texas Water Development Board, Water Water Board <coughs> loan right. I mean, to reimburse. So, yeah. I mean, uh, if we choose that route uh, I'll, on the next agenda, I'll bring you another resolution to reimburse the district. Should we amend the motion to go with <coughs> item B or C? Uh, and, and no, C. just stay no, with C. C. Okay. C. Just stay with C. Oh, okay. And then just the give. Yeah, it gives them time to fix what they need, bring it to us later. To yeah, I mean, we have to do an environmental clearance right. that'll cost Motion made by Mr. Houston and second by Mr. Avalos. Uh, for the Rick Wales, seconded. Mr. Well, uh, R. Well seconded. Are all those in favor? Aye. Aye. They are. Any opposed? No motion carries. Thank you. Look forward to seeing that project come real fast. And Do we have to Thank bring the other one, the other resolution back to get rid of yes. it? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to 13, consider and discuss for possible approval of write-off of accounts of fiscal year 17 and 18. This. Uh, is an annual uh, write-off of, of uh, uh, bad, bad account, uh, bad debt. Um, the this list that I had uh, prepared has uh, has been updated since the, this packet was done. Uh, we've had a few of these accounts paid, and the new amount. Um, is one thousand nine sixty three and seven cents. So, if we when we approve this tonight, you'll still continue to try to collect on these outstanding debts, and then in the future, if any of these people come back, it's almost like deadbeats, yeah. and they want to reconnect, we collect the bad debt. It doesn't go away. That is correct. Yes. And you have you are making efforts to collect it in house. And you continue to make the effort, so I'll make a motion to approve the amended amount because we're closing out the fiscal year, correct? Yes. <clears throat> and so we need to do it tonight, do that, but to encourage staff to continue to make their calls. I have one question. Last year we had two giant ones on there they were going to pursue. One was the yacht club guy, the other one was the weatherman. Did we get anywhere with them? But we need more more information from the customer. If we 
don't have it, it's like, I can't do it. Physical address on where the bills were sent? Not no, where to, to file them. Well, I can tell you where John's at. He lives at Arbor Island. Who's that? Uh, Alan. Or he lives oh, no, no, he paid off. He oh, he did pay off. And then you, no, well, that one was. Well, the other, one, the other one left the area. Yeah, we can't mention names. All right, we have a motion <laughs> and a second. Don't pay your bills, I'll mention your name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm looking saying. at millionaires on this list. <laughs> yeah. Not now. And it, it irritates me. Not now. We we got a motion and a second. Motion okay. made by uh, Mr. D. Wells, yeah. and there was a second by Avalos. Mr. Avalos. Yeah. Yeah. Are all those in favor? Aye. Aye. There are any proposals? <laughs> None. Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Moving to item number 14. Consider and discuss for possible <coughs> approval of the five year capital improvement plan. Mr. Chairman, could I suggest that with the lateness of the hour, yes. we postpone this item to the next meeting so we can have a, a serious discussion without. Do you want to table it? Or? Yeah, just table it to the next yeah, meeting. Motion by Mr. Houston. Second. To table. Seconded by D. Wells. Are all those in favor? Aye. Uh, there are. Any opposed? None. Motion carries. I would Thank like you. to just make a comment yes. in regards to this particular item is that. Uh, I think I spoke to Mr. Galvan here recently about updating our our, our capital <coughs> improvement plan, CRP, to, you know, yeah. to a comprehensive plan, right. analysis right. of our system. That's what this is. And but I think it needs to be updated. I think we actually because do we are, are all these items budgeted? Uh, well, we just budgeted one fiscal year. And right. So the and so and the, so that's my concern because. We're kind of, I feel like right now the way we're operating is we're kind of just like, okay, well, do we have money for that? Let's move on that. And I, I would like to, for us to really consider doing a comprehensive plan where we know that okay, we, that we're doing things today that two years or three years from now, we'll have the resources That'll be our for our next that. meeting discussion. Table this, yes. yeah. So we'll table it. So that's excellent points we brought yes. up at that time. Yeah. On the paper. <laughs> move on to uh, all of our favor, yes, uh, item table. Moving to item number uh, 15, consider and discuss for possible approval of the purchase of a vacuum truck. We advertise and solicit for the purchase of a new vacuum truck to replace a uh, unit 31, a 2000 Volvo vacuum truck that we own. Uh, staff recommendation is going with Cross Truck Center of Texas, uh, based in Houston. For three hundred and twenty-five thousand four hundred and eighty-nine, this recommendation was based on uh, lead time and uh, price. Uh, we can service the chassis uh, here in the valley in Far Texas um, for the uh, vacuum system. Uh, they have a mobile service plan. They can, they can come down to the district or not willing to send it to Far. Enrique, I think you did an excellent job here. I mean, as far as getting the number of bids for us to look at, it's over the whole gamut of the considerations. Uh, right, Mr. Wells? But. <laughs> but, I knew you were going to say that. Uh, you know, does, does this have the positive replacement back that we discussed in the past? Am I saying that correct? Yeah. Yes. yes. Positive, positive placement vacuum. Are all these positive placement vacuums? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then I have to look at, you know, that rush is not the low bidder. Yes. But he said the time, the lead time was well, up. he didn't tell us what the lead time was. It's, it's right a little bitter. It's on the top. 135 days. Yeah, the two, uh, the lead time is uh, 8 to 7 up here. Also. What's 240 to 260? Days. 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 That's how long it takes to get one. You have to build them. Okay. Are we all looking at apples across yes. the board? All, the, uh, all these. Have the apples. Apples. Yeah. All there. And then you mentioned that the rush truck has the local repair center that can take care of us. They have a mobile service by Mobile service. Yes. From yeah. your rush. No, I'm not rush. I am the body that's put on the rush truck. Okay. And our 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 end as far as body, the positive displacement, lower the vacuum system in general. We have a mobile transport. 
So Russia just Peterbilt. 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 So they don't have a. So Rush, Rush has a. Rush and you have a unit that can be put together quick. We have two units on there. We have one with Rush Peterbilt and then we have one with Freightliner. The Freightliner one uh, is the one that has the 240 days. The Freightliner. Yes. It's only because they can't get a. Right. So. Freightliner, how come you're so long getting a Freightliner in here? You're making a lot of trucks. What's going to happen? Yeah, why? Why? Because you don't want to. You're talking about a, a 2019, and you don't have a 2018. No, these, these are 2020s. 2020s. These, these are all 2020s. Uh, what I found out in doing this bid is normally the business the business I've done is buy for the HJC. And you can correct me if I'm wrong or as to it, but there's been a sudden increase in uh, people buying chassis and the demand has gone up significantly. Uh, so all the chassis manufacturers are kind of in a, in a situation where they're trying to get truck orders filled for 20, 30 units to certain customers in the end. And, and they're just stretching out the days. And um, I, I you can probably have more to that. Yeah, right now it's all out for the remainder of the year, so we're working on slots for the remainder of the year for next year. And that's the same thing with Peterbilt. The Peterbilt company that we use out of Houston has a few slots available that have, uh, I guess, it's expedited, willing to expedite the task. That's what well, I can agree with six thousand dollars. We get a six. We get a lot quicker. Uh, we spend a lot more of that on rental of a unit recently. I agree, Mr. Houston. I personally appreciate the excellent work you did here and give us a very comprehensive spreadsheet. Saying uh, that, I'll move that we accept staff's recommendation. Second. Second. Moved by Mr. Houston, seconded by D. Wells. Are all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, uh, one question, Greg Liner. I just assume that you, know, you guys can't build them quick enough to say make, a great, make America great again. It's working. Moving <laughs> 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 to 216. Uh, consider. <laughs> Thank you, Good night. Uh, Consider and review expenditures for September 1 through 15, 2018. Any questions or comments about any one in particular? Otherwise, a motion to approve them all. So moved. Motion made by D. Wells for approval of all the expenditures. To accept as presented. Huh? To accept as presented. Yes. Yeah. To We're accept. not approving the right. right. Accept. Motion to accept. Uh, need a motion to adjourn the meeting at 7.44 p.m. So moved. Motion so moved. 